So this is the final sutta class for this year. It was for uh, number 12 in Vasa 2022. The, uh, and of course, uh, you know, the final one, I guess, about liberation, Nibbana, the final result of all the practice, the last 11 classes. <laughs> Man, there's some people who just kind of snuck in at the last minute to just hear liberation. <laughs> yeah, they just want the shortcut. They just <laughs> you don't want the you want the result and not the practice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, probably is. So we, we've we've already mentioned a few times about how you know, the practice results in liberation. On one hand, it's uh, it's fairly easy. The theory is fairly easy. You know, it's, it's a causal process. Basically, you do the practice and the results happen. Liberation happens. However, when it comes to the practicalities, it's a little, little more complex, like the details of the practice. So that's why you need 11 classes of practice and one of Nibbana. <laughs> and even then it's not guaranteed <laughs> but it's basically a conditioned process liberation is a conditioned process as if you remember it was a few lessons ago about causality discourse number 23 chapter 12 of the connected discourses transcendental dependent origination you know, suffering gives rise to faith Faith gives rise to gladness, and then joy, and tranquility, and yeah, goes right through, right, right through to the, to the final ending of the five, the three outflows of existence, yeah. outflows of, of self, and then, it, then we have to follow back again. You know, it, is, it goes through this whole process. You know, of uh, from tranquility, there's happiness, collectedness, then knowledge and vision of the way things really are, then uh, nibida, the disillusionment, dispassion, liberation, and uh, the uh, ending of these outflows, the three outflows of sensuality, becoming, and ignorance. Yeah, there is also, a, you know, there's a, a, a cause for that. There's actually a definite cause for it. That is to contemplate the rise and fall of the five groups of grasping, which was last week's topic, right? Five groups of grasping, yeah. Basically, it's, it's uh, uh, relinquishing all identification with everything that we would identify with as being ourself. And the five groups of grasping are the fundamental functions of life, you know, body, feelings, uh, Recognizing or, or perception, and then uh, sankharas, mental activities dominated by intention, and knowing or vinyan. Those are kind of the five basic ones. And there's all, and then there's the six senses also. Six senses are included within the five groups of grasping: the 
five physical senses and this mind is a sixth sense. Now these, are the, these are the basic, most fundamental sources of identification. You ask yourself, what do I really, what's must my real self? Before we have to answer one of those. What's your real self? The body? Memory? Feelings? What is it then? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know that, but can you do it? <laughs> I still want to be happy. I still don't want to suffer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. The, the theory is easy, but to put it into practice, a little more complicated. But it really just depends upon one's commitments, one's, uh, one's, one's uh, continuity of practice. Arjun Chah said, if you live your life developing sila samadhi panya, you, you should be, you know, should be at least a sotapanna, a stream enterer, stream enterer at the end of your life. If your whole life you're practicing sila, morality, meditation, wisdom, then of course you should be enlightened. Why not? Hmm? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. however, you know, trying to do that every day of your life, yeah, no, it's a little more complicated, huh? Just to sit there and think, oh, yes, when I die, I'll have Sila Samadhi Panya. Where's that book again? <laughs> take, take, the, take the quick, quick version. Not, <laughs> not, not the big book. <laughs> not the big sutta, sutta, sutta book collection here. Just take the short version. <laughs> a summary. <laughs> but to put it into practice every day, you know, it requires some commitment, some, some continuity of practice. I mean, the, in the, this uh, condition process, it talks about how, how suffering gives rise to faith. You know, faith or, or trust in the teachings or confidence in the teachings. Then you try and put it into practice now. But if, we, you know, we don't have initial faith in it, faith in the practice, and requires some degree of, okay, this is the way it is, this is what I have to do, then get on with it. And then practice it in your life then. So basically, you know, the liberation is a result of the practice. And there's various, if you read the, that discourse I mentioned, 112 in the middle length discourses, there are six different ways, you know, there are many different ways, actually, but six main ones, which uh, different, you know, different people have different temperaments, and so, you know, as I mentioned, uh, like last time, some people maybe have a particular uh, tendency to identify with the senses. People who are very sensual, you know, they love sight, sound, smells, taste, touch. You know, people who are say, you know. Uh, musicians or something, yeah, they they really refine their way of thinking, their way of hearing. The the, the, the philosophers were refined their way of thinking. And philosophy, though, maybe that's a good way of putting your thoughts. People, <laughs> people are also confused, also <laughs> identify with their thoughts. <laughs> but the, you know, depending upon how you how you how you you use your energies. Where do your energies go? Into the sense realm? Yeah. Or maybe it is, you know, like memory. Some people, they spend a lot of time in their memories. I mean, when I was, when I was a student, I remember my first, reading my first book on Buddhism. And this was a, it was a, I couldn't understand very much of it, but I remember, you know, one phrase, one sentence, and it said, you know, there's no past, there's no future, there's only the present moment. And I was studying science, so I said, of course, only the present moment, you know. A memory is a thought in your mind right now. Uh, a plan for the future is a thought in your mind right now. Yeah. So I said, oh, that, that means, you know, I'll just try and I should dwell in the present moment. So I looked at my mind and I realized I was hardly ever in the present moment. <laughs> Going over old memories and planning for the future, and I was always in the future or the past. I said, oh, well, just come back to the present. 
for one second, I'm off again, in the future. <laughs> End of the past again, oh yeah, those yesterday, last week, oh, I did this, and then next week I'll go here and go there, and oh, right, present moment, right? <laughs> so, so, it was really painful, but it gave me a really, really important lesson because I realized my mind is out of control. You know, I know the present moment is the only reality, but I'm not there. So my mind is out of control. So I must train the mind then. But I was at university studying engineering, so I couldn't control my mind. <laughs> the classes controlled my mind. I had to go there and study this and study that. And <laughs> so, so I had to put on hold for a few years anyway. <laughs> But the, uh, the, the probably the, I mentioned last time, I think it was, yeah, talking about the five groups of grasping, especially the, the sanya, the recognition. We already have distorted or we have trained our mind or distorted our mind, actually, by having certain ways of perceiving or remembering things. It's actually, uh, sanya is actually uh, it's it's a uh, sanya. It's a knowledge that puts things together. So it, it gives names to things. It gives meaning to things. It's that quality of mind that gives meaning. Vinyan is knowing. It just knows. There's a sense impression. So you know there's a shape and a color right there. So Vinyan knows that, and Sanya says, "I recognize that book. I saw this book last time. I mean, I saw this last time. It must be a book." And then Sankara says, oh, it's a book, it's to be read. I do something with it now. So Sankara is a manager, it's an organizer, it, it initiates action. It's mostly from willpower. Will initiates action. But Sanya just recognizes what it is. But if I was really hungry, I might think, oh, it's a box of chocolate. <laughs> then I open it up and say, oh, no, no, it's not a box of chocolate. Okay, try again. <laughs> Second guess. <laughs> so, but depending upon my conditioning, my education, my memories, it already colors what this sanya sees. Yeah. I mean, if, if I took this into Africa somewhere, you know, some tribe somewhere in Africa and showed them this, they had no idea what it is. Wouldn't reckon. I don't have, I don't have a word for book, maybe. Maybe some, some African tribe or anywhere, you know, tribe in Canada could be, you know. <laughs> Didn't recognize a book. Yeah, maybe, maybe even nowadays, not just a tribe, but some people, some young people haven't even seen a book before. All they see is their mobile phone in front of their face. <laughs> they never look at a book. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, so wouldn't recognize it or... After 100 years, people wouldn't even recognize a book anymore. <laughs> it was all digitalized, you see. But if you have the memory, and if, if that sanya is about a skillful thing, a useful thing, then you keep reinforcing that. So it gives you more skillful thoughts. If it's an unskillful memory, you know, like this is the basis of people's traumas, for example. They had a very, very strong fright in their life. You know, they got attacked by a dog. That was one I used before. When they're very young, then they have this trauma. Whenever they see a dog, it brings up fear. You know, even cute little puppies, <gasps> they're frightened and think, oh, what's wrong with them? Yeah, what's, what's wrong with them? But there is, a, there is this imprint of this memory deep within their psyche, this, this type of this, this image of a, of a four-legged creature means to them fear and pain. With other people, it means, oh, puppy, you know, happy, play, or something or other. But to that person, it means fear and, and pain. See? It's already deeply programmed into them. If you realize, and that influences how we think, how we perceive the world, how we relate to the world. But the Buddha is telling us there are some skillful ways to transform that into more skillful perceptions, cognitions, memories. Then you change that, and you see things differently. And what were the most important way, new ways of training the mind? To see impermanence, to see unsatisfactoriness, to see 
not no personal self rather than always look at permanence happiness and self you can transform it so reflecting upon these these like like the five groups of grasping reflecting upon them as impermanent arising and passing arising and passing normally you see a feeling you believe it as something real oh i feel happy oh how wonderful it's wonderful i want to keep it and you forget it's impermanent when it does fade away you're disappointed say oh this can't be true i have bad karma well what what, what do i do, do to deserve this you know whatever <laughs> we have more stories about it where you just if, if you just know already it's impermanent so pleasant feeling arises it is bound to pass away eventually and then likewise most important is unpleasant feeling yeah? unpleasant feeling arises people grab hold of it and say oh i don't like this i don't want this and they grab hold of the unpleasant feeling to get rid of it and they it even gets even stickier and they get more tense and they get more worried about it they get frightened about it never going to go away no no i'll be tortured with this forever and it just gets more and more permanent but if you can step back and just notice it's impermanent sometimes you can actually look at the pain you notice it's it's pulsing yeah? it's throbbing it's pulsing it's it's getting bigger and smaller and more intense and yeah. it's not a permanent thing but as we we tend to look at it permanently something permanent and we fight with it so we have you know we have we increase our our distortions of perception then they get increased but at least you know some some part of the time if we can just contemplate and reflect you know impermanent impermanent if you remember that so basically yeah the first one of these if you read this discourse number 112 is called the sixfold purity six different ways to for for somebody to acknowledge their their awakening they've been awakened so if you remember the uh, what i said last time i think it was the last story about the, the buddha's instruction to bahia in the seen only the seen in the heard only the heard in the sensed only the sensed in the cognized only the cognized so this one monk says here regarding the seen i abide unattracted unrepelled independent detached free dissociated with a mind rid of the barriers regarding the herd of the sense the cognized i abide unattracted unrepelled so seeing this regarding this then the through not clinging my mind is liberated from the 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 outflows so this is the four, the four basic ones seeing hearing sensing and cognizing these are the six senses basically sensed is smell and touch smell taste and touch and cognizes the, the mind then there is the uh, reflection on the five groups of grasping having no one uh, the five groups of grasping to be feeble fading away and comfortless with the fading away cessation giving up relinquishment of attraction and a clinging so then i have understood my mind is liberated so one recognizes that these you know when when some when the like the five groups of grasping are feeble fading away feeble is unsatisfactory fading away is impermanent comfortless you can say is no permanent self so the fading away of fading away cessation giving up of attraction and clinging and the mind is liberated so and then they, there's also the six elements you know the four elements earth fire water air there's also the big six elements is consciousness and space so i've treated the, the earth element as not self with no self based on the earth element so the fading away cessation giving up relinquishment of attraction to the earth element and also the other other five elements 
then uh, understood that the mind is liberated. And then there is uh, then there is the uh, same same as with the the six senses, not only the six senses but the six senses, the six sense objects, the consciousness of them. I've understood that my mind is liberated. And then there is, uh, the, uh, then there is the cessation of eye-making. Okay. The, this is the one in which I mentioned about the, the, uh, the path of liberation. The, the, uh, the, uh, progressive path. So when the mind has collectedness, when developing the, the four absorptions, so then when the four absorptions are developed, with the mind thus purified, cleansed, passionless, without defilements, subtle, workable, steady, imperturbable, then you direct the mind to this is unsatisfactoriness, this is the cause of unsatisfactoriness, this is cessation, this is the path. These are the outflows of sensuality, of becoming, and of ignorance. This is the cause of them and the cessation in the path. So, I mean, it's not just thinking about them with the mind thus purified when directs the mind towards these things, when contemplates and reflects upon them very, very deeply. And the mind is very, very deeply calm. Those perceptions, those, those, uh, those, uh, this, this perception or way of seeing goes very, very deep inside. Normally people's minds are so distracted, you know, they try and think about one thing and pff, they go here and go there and they pff, can't see anything very clearly. But when the mind is very, very still and very focused, then that, 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 that one perception goes very, very deep it penetrates very, very deeply. And then uh, our deeper realization can say the way things really are then. It sees how they really are. And then, of course, the contemplation with the Buddha gave most, well, maybe not, not most frequently, but one he mentioned many times was to contemplate the five groups of grasping. Whatever kind of, this is my translation of them, embodying feelings, recognizing, willing, inhabiting, bare knowing, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, coarse or subtle, inferior or, or, or superior, far or near. One sees all of these as it really is with right wisdom. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. So like I mentioned, I mean, these contemplations are supported by right mindfulness and right concentration. So it's not just the ordinary thinking, which most people, when they're just thinking about things, they don't have so much clear seeing mindfulness or, or, or focused attention, do they? Yeah. So at developing those qualities, these factors of awakening, if you like, provide the right foundation where they breakthrough, penetrative insight into the way things really are. And uh, sometimes I would say that there are some people who have a deep insight kind of spontaneously. Yeah? I mean, they mention in the, in the scriptures a very structured path of practice. Uh, you've got to develop, you know, the, the morality, meditation, wisdom. But some people, just their mind is just right, ripe, ripe for it. You know, like in the time of the time of the Buddha, of course, if you got a discourse from the Buddha just after his enlightenment, very very charismatic presence, you know, like like Yasa, the uh, first layman to be awakened. You know, he wasn't mentioned that he I mean, he's being a kind of a uh, well-off person. He probably had he was a kind of a moral person, upright person, practiced generosity, 
morality, but no mention of ever practicing meditation. Whereas the other, the early disciples of the Buddha were all either, they were all former uh, religious seekers. They were all meditators. They were all samanas. Some were, some were Brahmins, some were, some were not Brahmins. But they'd already practiced meditation, so the Buddha just said a few words and they, oh yeah, I got it. They already had, you can say, sila samadhi, they just needed the panya. But I think yasa didn't even have samadhi. However, if you're standing, sitting in front of the Buddha, I imagine, I never experienced it, but I imagine, <laughs> just after his enlightenment, very, very charismatic presence. I guess I could say I had a little taste of it with Ajahn Chah. Ajahn Chah gave a talk. You know, I mean, he was, he was so present. He was so present. That was one of the qualities I would recognize of him. He was so present. When you're, when you're with him, you feel he's right there. He looks at you, so it could be a shock, because his, all his energy is focused on you. And suddenly you feel like a big spotlight on you. You want to... <laughs> So was, and then, then, of course, it was not only did he have a lot of focus, I would say concentration, but he also, I would say, had a lot of mindfulness. So he could read you very well. Some people even thought he could read your mind. I don't, I don't necessarily you know, believe that, but who knows, maybe he did. I just say he had a lot of mindfulness, presence of mind. So if you really have a lot of presence of mind, you can read people's, you know, body language, verbal language, even mental language. You're really present with them. We talk about body language these days. You know, there was somebody I knew in, in Switzerland and she was, she did some body work. It was her, her profession. And she could just look at people walking and she could tell what kind of person they were, just the way they walked. <laughs> oh, there's a banker walking there. <laughs> she could also tell when people were not walking correctly, you see, because it was part of her, part of this training was to, to walk in a correct way, stand in a particular way, and, and walk in a particular way. It was all about balancing out your body and not getting imbalanced. So she could just look at people. I mean, I couldn't see it, but she was trained that way. She could read their body language. Or she didn't need to go up and ask them, what do you do for a living? She could tell where they devoted most of their time. You know, somebody who was sporty, somebody who was just sitting at a desk all day long. <laughs> I could probably tell those, but <laughs> hunched over. <laughs> but uh, so some, sometimes people just have that, maybe some of it's sort of like innocence. Yeah, they sit, they, they're sitting there listening to the Buddha teach and you know, just they're really they're really open, open to it, receptive to it. They aren't judging, they aren't speculating, they aren't kind of, uh, you know, thinking I like it or dislike it. They're just listening. There's all story about one of the one, uh, somebody who was a leper. Remember, Supa Buddha was a leper, wandering around in Savati or somewhere, and he saw this crowd of people. So he thought, oh, lots of people there. It must be a food offering. Maybe I'll go and get some food. So he got there and people were crowded around to listen to the Buddha. So he said, oh, darn, no food. You know? <laughs> but I'm here anyway, so maybe I'll just listen in to this, what this person's saying. You know? And again, he must have just had his, you know, kind of a pure heart. He was really sincerely open-minded to listen. And the Buddha surveyed the crowd apparently and saw this person's ready for it. So he more or less gave a teaching just to that, that one person. And the one person was, uh, he got it, became a sotapanna right there on the spot. So next time you're listening to a Dhamma talk. <laughs> Maybe you're too drowsy from the heavy meal today. <laughs> and midday too. So, <laughs> But sometimes like when I wanted to listen to Ajahn Chah, for example, it was so interesting, and just the curiosity effect. You know, what was he going to say? And you never knew what he's going to say. He was so, you know, so present. You could never, never anticipate what he's going to say. 
Yeah, where most people, when you hear a few words, oh, here it goes again, the same old story, you know. <laughs> but I can say, like, you know, because he was, I don't know if I can if I should say that or not, but because he was so non-self, he didn't repeat his old self over and over again, you see. So he, he was just, in the present moment, dealing with the situation as it arose right now. Present situation is always changing, so his answers always change. So you never know what he's going to say, and surprising people all the time. <laughs> so there was that quality of curiosity too. What's he going to say about this? Yeah. <laughs> this one time there was a group of us sitting around, and there was, a, there was an Anagarika there. So Ajahn Chah just turned to the Anagarika and says, oh, oh, so you come to, you want to ordain, do you? And he said, oh, oh yes, yes. He said, you can't. You, you, you have too much greed, he said. <laughs> so, so the other guy was deflated. So anyway, then a few, I don't know, a few days later, the same thing happened again. Najin Chah said, oh, do you want to ordain then? Huh? He said, uh, no, I don't want to ordain. So you don't have to then. If you don't want to, you don't have to. <laughs> and now the other guy was really confused. <laughs> and it happened again the third time. Najin Chah asked him, do you want to ordain? He says, I don't care. He says, now you're ready, he said. <laughs> whatever will be, you know. I just accept whatever happens. Yeah, now you got it. <laughs> you aren't greedy for it and you aren't rejecting it. You aren't attracted to it and aren't, aren't rejecting it. So then you're ready for it. You just open to whatever happens. <laughs> so the um this this uh, reflect these reflections, yeah. If one develops them, then a certain transformation happens. You know, the first one is, they talk about the different levels of awakening. Uh, people can have some kind of initial insight, see things a little bit more clearly, but it's not till there is what they call the level of stream enterer, that there's a complete transformation in your being. They call it entering the stream. The first deep insight, I mean, it was mentioned uh, in the stories the Buddha talked about when he gave teachings, the, the realization that occurred to these people was all that arises is subject to ceasing. So it was, a, it was an insight into impermanence. But the, the, uh, the commentary mentions that what it really means is that they had the first insight into non-self, no permanent self. If everything arises, and passes away everything, even yourself, so-called self, arises and passes away. Then it's not a permanent self, is it? So suddenly your your illusion of oh, you know, here I am, a certain particular entity which has to have to preserve and hold on to and defend. Is you know, we we can't do it really. It arises and passes away, due to its own processes, own causes and effects. Yeah, we can we can contribute to the cause and effects to change it in some ways, but ultimately we won't have complete control over it, even the way we call ourselves. Then, when somebody has that insight, then a great burden of clinging, of grasping, falls away. And some of these outflows, like sensuality and becoming and ignorance, fade away to a certain degree, not completely. Only the so-called arahant, the fully enlightened being, has totally put an end to sensuality, becoming, and ignorance. But the sotapanna you know, reduces some sensuality. They say the, the sotapanna can never break the five precepts. So they keep the five precepts. So even though they may you know, go past a pub someday, you know, they will never be tempted in. <laughs> Even if it's a hot day, <laughs> or if they do, they go in and ask for alcohol-free beer. <laughs> One of the five precepts is not taking alcohol, not, not drinking, not, not getting intoxicated, you see. So, so they keep the five precepts automatically. They can't break them. You see. And the, the becoming, you know, the uh, lower realms of existence are, are, are closed to them. They won't get reborn in the lower realm. 
They can still get reborn in the human realm up to seven times and higher realms. But the, the lower realms are closed to them now. So certain levels of existence, of becoming, are sealed. And certain degrees of ignorance pass away. And then, of course, with the Sakadagami and the Anagami, the next two levels, it, even, it increases more. The, uh, the uh, sensuality is decreased even further. And even for the, what they call the, the once-returner, the non-returner, then all the, all the lower realms, even the human realm, is closed. They only return to the, they only, they don't come back to the human realm, they go, only go to a higher heaven realm. And then the hour hunt, no realms of existence. It, the, any kind of existence is exhausted. So the, uh, this uh, experience, I mean, it's just getting matter of getting deepened and deepened and deepened. You know, once one has gets, once one one's understood the principle, at least the, theoretically, one can apply it, and gradually it begins to change your, your perceptions. Your Sunday gets changed more and more uh, radically and deeper and deeper you know, until there is this insight into, into what we call the stream entry insight. And they say you never forget that. You may, well, you, you can forget it for up to seven times, but you never lose it. A stream enterer always recognizes that there is there is no permanent self, knows that, but frequently they get lost in clinging to a self, but <laughs> up to seven lifetimes, <laughs> but not a really serious one, not really, really dangerous one in the lower realms, you see. But this requires practice, 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 practice. So for some people, it uh, maybe requires time to practice. Yeah, some people are, they, they're, maybe their meditation not so, not so deep, not so profound, but living in the right environment, you know, keeping them away from unskillful things. You know, maybe like, like I remember meeting, these, meeting some novices in Thailand, you know, young novices, well, they weren't, yeah, they were, a novice is somebody who's younger than 20 years of age. And some of these novices, they went to the monastery when they're, when they're, they're children. Parents sent them there. You know, as a young child, maybe they had to because they had they couldn't feed them. Maybe so. So they they came they, when they when they got a bit older, they came up to the time they're going to be monks, and they were traveling around with you know going to Dong and experiencing wider wider having wider experiences. And I met some of these, and they they to me they were so naive. Yeah, they never know they had never any suffering in their life. Most suffering they have was being without supper. That's the most suffering they had, which, you know, for some people is, is a lot. <laughs> but, uh, but since they grow up with it, you know, for, since they're 10 years old, they grow up with it. It's just normal. They, they were, their body's already adapted, you see. For me, it's harder for, young, for older people who come to the monastery to adapt to. But when they're very young, they adapt to it, and, and they just had no, no suffering in their life. There's even one, Eng one American, one... Uh, a Westerner, a Westerner I knew, he was also very naive, a couple of them actually. <laughs> they went from, from their mother's kitchen to the monastery kitchen, basically. <laughs> never had a job, never had to, had to work for a living, yeah. never, had, never had a broken heart, never had a girlfriend who had a broken heart. <laughs> but they still, they still had, you know, they had interest. You know, what is, what's, what's, what's with this, what's with that? And they, they were so naive, and then I thought, oh, why don't you just disrobe and go and suffer, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but then I realized that if they do go out and suffer, it's dangerous out there. <laughs> they, they, they may really suffer and not come back, you know? Or they could, they could uh, you know, get, get really caught in some kind of situation, you know, end up an alcoholic or a drug addict, I mean, if they're in a monastery, maybe they don't go that far, but <laughs> on the other hand, maybe they really want to find out <laughs> you know, and overdo it, you know, or just get into a situation, you know, get in debt or something, or, you know, have a, have a family, you know, and then they're, they're, they're tied down. And, yeah. and there was one, one man I met, he was a monk for nearly 10 years, I think, yeah. and he eventually left. 
And he had he got married, had a family, and had a job, and a businessman, and all this, and, and a business. And uh, then I met him again 20 years later. And fortunately, he still had interest in monastic life. He was very, very touched by Ajahn Chah's presence. Ajahn Chah actually kind of, kind of gave him special attention. Ajahn Chah made him a point of being, especially asking for him and being very kind to him. And you know, he, he was a little bit, uh, he was very shy and wouldn't be, wouldn't, wouldn't seek out to, to, to Ajahn, go see Ajahn Chah. So Ajahn Chah would ask him, where, where is he? Where's this monk? Where's this monk? And one time he asked, where's this monk? Where? Tell him to come here. I need a massage. I need a massage. You know? <laughs> so, so, so he, he asked him up to the, to the front of the, the area, you know, come and massage him in front of all these monks, you see. And then they, he couldn't speak Thai very well. So he said, oh, uh, and he knows that you shouldn't touch the monk without asking permission. So he says, oh, ka akat ka <laughs> It's a Thai joke. Akat, Okat. He asked for, he said, you see, he's asking for air <laughs> rather than asking for permission. I said, she says, oh no, you can have air is free. You can just keep breathing, he said. <laughs> no. <laughs> he was a very, very sweet monk. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, he still had interest in monastic life, but he already. He'd been out and had a family, and then he, I met him 20 years later, and he says, you know, Ajahn, he said, it was a total waste of time. <laughs> 20 years wandering around Sangsara, it was a total waste of time, he said. <laughs> and he's sort of back to square one again, you know, back to, you know, back to studying Buddhism again and spiritual practice, meditating. <laughs> but uh, now the wiser for it, I can say, at least anyway. <laughs> So the um, the uh, practice, even though it's you know it's uh, there's first of all we're lucky there's a variety of very very clearly defined paths of practice. I mean if we didn't have, we didn't have someone like the Buddha who was already traveled the path and experienced it, experienced that it does lead to the end of suffering, to, to tell us how many of us would be wandering around looking. I was looking at different paths for years trying a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of the other thing. And, but then you come across the Buddhist teachings, very, very clearly defined, eightfold path, this is how you practice, just do it. Of course, you know, that's, that's the, the first step. <laughs> then it's helpful to have, have some friends, find some, some good friends to help you do the practice because there's, you know, as you try to develop, you know, like, like uh, some of the meditation exercises, you know, it's, there's not a lot of details in the scriptures about all the, the problems that arise, you know, the doubts and confusions, you know, and these things. Having somebody there, some guide, some, some good friend to guide you through the confusion and doubts, very helpful. You know, and it's to be able to have, give you that sense of patience to carry through, through the ups and downs and the, the storms and the, and, the, and, the, and the droughts and things. But eventually, ideally, one arrives at... Nibbana. Yeah. <laughs> and it's kind of this Nibbana, I don't know, what, maybe for Thai people it's not, not very mysterious, is it? Nibbana? Very common, huh? <laughs> but but in, in the West, Nibbana, Nirvana, ooh. Yeah, nirvana sounds like a really exotic, far off place, you know? Yeah, so up there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, up there, really high up, yeah, yeah. And you're up there and drinking ambrosia and, and <laughs> but it's not so mysterious really. I mean sometime the Buddha explained it in very, very practical terms, in the in positive terms, in Nibbana, Nibbanang Paranang Sukang. Nibbana is the ultimate well being. Or you know, in, in, in other practical terms, the ending of greed, aversion, delusion is called Nibbana. Without grasping, one realizes Nibbana. The ending of craving is Nibbana. So, I mean, in a way, yeah, if, you, if you can acknowledge when you're observing your states of mind, remember that exercise, 
observing greed, aversion, delusion, but also observing non-greed, non-aversion, non-delusion. So when you observe in the mind, there's no greed, aversion, delusion there, even just you know, temporarily, little Nibbana. <laughs> but of course, the, the, the point is to try and you know, make, it, make, it, make it more permanent, <laughs> more, more sustainable. Yeah? As somebody said, it's easy to be enlightened, it's just very hard to stay enlightened. <laughs> yeah. You can even kind of, you know, kind of read inspiring works, inspirational works, and get very, very high-minded. Yeah. But then, you know, then you get hungry and tired, and you got to come back to Earth again, and so <laughs> come back crashing down again. Yeah. But and he also explained it. Uh, there's, there's a somewhere in the scriptures. I forget exactly where. There's a whole list of different um, description, not descriptions, but names for nibbana. You know, the the deathless, the unconditioned, uh, the the undying. Uh, but it's also kind of a, a mystical explanation. There is the not born, not become, not made, not constructed. Yeah. So when, because that exists, I mean, you could say Nibbana is the, the unconditioned. So we are functioning in the conditioned, constructed world, and Nibbana is outside that. You know, in a way, Nibbana is always present. It's always here. But we're so obstructed and so, you know, so grasping of a self, it, it, it prevents us from seeing it, prevents us from experiencing it. It's like the, the air in the space here. You know, how, many, how many of us even notice that there's a lot of space here? We're looking at objects all the time, things, you see. You know, this is what our self is. It's self is always you know, things and objects and constructed things and something solid and tangible. And Nibbana is the space outside, the unconditioned that's there. There is the escape, the peaceful, the beyond conceptual thought. The stable, the not born, the unproduced, the sorrowless, stainless state, the end of painful things, the calming of conditions. There is the sphere where there is neither earth, water, fire, air. There's not the sphere of infinite space, infinite consciousness. There is neither this world nor another world or both, and no sun or moon even. Uh. There's no coming, no going, no abiding, no passing away, no arising. That is not established, not functioning, without foundation. This is the end of dukkha. So it's something we can hardly imagine, right? Can you imagine, you know, the undying or the unconditioned? Yeah. You know, we know what the conditioned is, you know, this conditioned realm here, but what's the unconditioned? Your mind stops. That's... Your mind stops, that's Nibbana. <laughs> the beyond conceptual thought. <laughs> but basically, you know, it's a, rather than kind of speculate what's Nibbana, you know, it's important, the Buddha didn't, didn't mention it much. Most of the scriptures are about how to do the practice. So basically, I mean, you practice the Dhamma, Leave the rest up to Kama. <laughs> Whereas some people, they just waste their time speculating. Oh, Nibbana is like this and like that, and it's wonderful. And, you know. But in a way, it's just absolutely normal, Nibbana. Thinking about yourself, living in the conditioned world, is totally abnormal. <laughs> that's delusion, that's ignorance. <laughs> and Nibbana is beyond all that, you see. <laughs> so Nibbana is pa absolutely normal. You know? And it, it, there was, you know, of course, uh, there's lots of speculation about you know, what's an arahant. You know? And uh, you know, they have different theories about what, you know, arahant. They even, some people even think that an arahant never touches the ground, right? They kind of hover above the ground, you see. Yeah. But a Buddha left his footprints, you know, his footprints in Saraburi, right? 
There's Buddhist footprints all over the world, actually. <laughs> in in, the, in Sri Lanka, on top of, top of Adam's Peak, they call it Sri Pada. Apparently, they have Buddhist footprint up there. See? But, you know, historically, the Buddha never went to Sri Lanka, but I shouldn't tell them. People have to, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe, in, maybe it's sort of, uh, what do you call it, sort of archetypally, ar archetype-wise, he went there. Because Buddhism spread there to, you know, where the Dhamma is, the Buddha is, you see. But I would say, like, uh, the, some of the, the wise, at least the wise meditation teachers I met in Thailand, I would say, you know, there's nothing special about them, really. They're just absolutely normal. You know, Ajahn Chah was the most, most sane person I ever met. <laughs> and in his presence, everybody else seems crazy. Because <laughs> he was just totally present in the present moment. He had no, no, he had no agendas, no self-interest. Yeah. So he was just totally, you can say, free of his of any self-interest. So perfectly normal, just seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, responding to people. Yeah. But for most people, all these actions are kind of are kind of twisted around, distorted through their own self, through their own neurosis, their own confusion and ignorance. So it comes across as craziness. <laughs> so the arahant is just perfectly normal, that's all. <laughs> so, so rather than kind of raise them up and to be something super special, you can just see that they're just very, very normal. I mean, but I mean, it's, it's you know, normal having, having, having real, Pure mindfulness, collectedness, you know, and and uh, morality and these qualities, you know, very very positive qualities. Yeah, so they aren't they aren't something special, I would say, but in a way they are because they're, they're not really the same the same level. And trying to talk about an hour hunt in in kind of ordinary worldly terms or, you know, just just you know conceptual terms doesn't really apply anymore. You know, they're beyond all kinds of. The Buddha said he was. He couldn't be kind of pinned down to any kind of normal concept. He's not the body, not feeling, not, 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 not perception, not um, sankara, not vinyan. He can't be pinned down. He's not a deva. Uh, he's not a human. He's not a deva. He's, he's a Buddha. <laughs> Unique case. <laughs> so. But the, the, the good news is that, you know, the, the more that you practice, yeah, the, the more this experience becomes within us, becomes part of us then. So just morally, we just keep practicing, you know. And some, some people it's the intensity of practice, some people it's the continuity of practice. Yeah, some people can have, they go on a very intensive retreat, and the trouble with intensive retreats is that maybe you have a, quite a strong experience, but... The problem is trying to sustain that. You know, I would say I, I've met people who've had bona fide insights, but they, they can't keep it up. Yeah. Maybe they, they they're, uh, don't have the right environment. You know, they, if, they're, if, they're, if they're a lay person, have, a, have a, a job and a family or something, then you know, they can have some kind of deep insight, but then they have to go back to being a person again you know, in their job and their family situation, and very hard to sustain then. That's why I think the Buddha pointed out the monastic life was the best environment. You know, even though we have to kind of be people sometimes too. <laughs> but we just pretend. You know. <laughs> we just tend, we pretend we're being normal people. But, <laughs> but, but at least we can, be, we can be a bit odd and we, people aren't surprised. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, the one thing is the having the experience, but also it's important to have the right environment to be able to cultivate it. Like like the Sotapanna, they say the stream enterer. You know, some people they they see it as they want to go on an intensive retreat and have this breakthrough to become a Sotapanna. But to me, it it means you know, stream enterer. You enter the stream. Well, you got to stay in the stream. You know, you know, you don't just go in and dip your toe in and come out again. You're a momentary stream enterer. 
you're back on solid ground again, you know, <laughs> but, but you aren't really in the stream anymore. Eh? So if you have an insight into impermanence, well, you have to live impermanently. Eh? You have to live that impermanence, hmm? not just to have, a, have an insight and then back to permanence again and get some solid ground and think, I've had a deep insight. I have had this deep insight. I am enlightened. Yeah, right. <laughs> that I that was enlightened is already gone, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's already closed. It isn't open anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's what Ajahn Chah, I think, in the wider perspective, that's what he was pointing out. You know, he didn't, he didn't uh, talk about enlightenment very much. You know, he gave some people, they needed a bit of a, you know, some, some, some goal or some object or some objective to go to, you know, but mostly he just talked about practice. There's a story that somebody, you know, one, probably one Westerner goes to watch and Chan says, well, what do you teach your, t your students then? He says, I teach my students that there's four o'clock meditation, there's five o'clock alms round, seven o'clock meal, you know, three o'clock water hauling. He said, wait, what do you teach them? What kind of profound insights do you teach them? Four o'clock meditation, four o'clock <laughs> morning puja, five o'clock homes around. <laughs> Just focus yourself on the present moment and go through those motions and the whole the whole lifestyle will kind of, you know, help you kind of let go, let go. If you surrender to it, have to let go of yourself. You have your views and opinions about it and why should I get up at four o'clock in the morning? Yeah, the, 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 the doctors say I should be eight hours sleep. <laughs> or I need eight hours sleep because I'm so intelligent or something, you know. <laughs> we just go up, just give up to it, and then the part of yourself gets worn away, worn away, worn away. And eventually, you can see, see the nature of a self. It's just constructed. You know? When the eye comes up, you know, oh, I and the, I and its memories and its its physical sensations and its whatnot and that, yeah, there it goes. That problem, just drop it. Back to the unconditioned again. It's right here all the time. So hopefully you can see it. <laughs>